you about a project called Regen. But the reason I'm standing up here first is my name is Maria Elena, I go by Nena, and I'm the director for the MESA program out at Butte College. I don't know how many of you are familiar with MESA. If you're familiar with MESA, Math, Engineering, and Science Achievement. And so uh, MESA is a program that focuses on students that are uh, first generation college students and have some uh, type of economic disadvantage that are declared in math, engineering, or sciences and that intend to transfer and graduate from a university and eventually be what we call STEM professionals or science, technology, engineering, or math professionals. And the reason that matters is because, as you all know, it's a complicated system right now. And if you've never had a parent that's gone through the process, and some of you in here may know that experience, it's pretty complicated. You don't always know where to go and where, who to ask for help. But the MESA program, what we do is we help them figure out the process while they're at their community college. And we also help them build skills and get all their tools sharpened for when they transfer so that they'll be successful in their university. And that eventually, again, they'll be successful engineers, math, or science professionals. Um, the other thing that I want to say is this presentation is being conducted by students who are interns on this project. And the reason I mention that part is this is actually very unique. They, this is actually a research project and it is rare to find a research project at a community college. The norm is that the MESA director or faculty would say, hey, HP is looking for someone. Sony's looking for someone or some other corporation and we'd hand them an application. And then they would go somewhere and do their internship. In this situation, we are so fortunate because we've collaborated with local professionals and faculty who are sitting here in the audience, Steve and John Dahlgren, and um, we do the project right here in our own community. I also want to tell you something else. Now you know their students, you can only imagine that this is a big deal and they're a little nervous. So I'd like to give them a chance to take a breath, and if you can please clap for them already because they have worked for months to prepare to be here, and if we could just give them a round. And they're going to introduce themselves, they're going to do a technical component, and they're going to do a personal component, so you can see what they've gotten out of it from an academic and a professional component as well. And that will be towards the end, and then I'll come back up here. But without further ado, thank you for being here. Thank you, Donna. That was a lovely introduction to the MESA program. You know, they've done a lot for us, giving us the framework to uh, develop as professionals. And we'd also like to thank the event coordinators for, you know, putting this together to uh, give us the opportunity to develop as professionals. Because we're all here to, you know, successfully transition into a career, and we hope that this project is a good launching platform for us to do that. So, uh, you know, my name is Willis Baker. I'm a mechanical engineering student here at Chico State. I uh, just transferred from Butte College. Um, who's the rest of my team here? My name is Robert Cardenas. I'm an electrical engineer, or going for an electrical engineering degree. And uh, I am actually at Butte College and I'm about to transfer. So. My name is Helena Rose. I'm an international ag development major. I'm studying the byproducts of the gas station process we'll be doing. And, uh, I'm Ashley Shields. I'm a geology major over at Duke College. I'm transferring to Chico State next semester. I'm also on the biochar portion of the project with Lena. And I'm <coughs> excited to talk about biochar. Yeah, so it's kind of started out. Um, did, you, did you know that California produces 2 million tons of rice per year? No. And that, that equates out to 480,000 tons of rice hulls. No. And, uh, you know, what, what, what do we do with these rice hulls? And uh, this information is coming from calrice.org. Um, you know, the problem with rice hulls is um, our agricultural industry here, you know, produces farms every year. It doesn't really give time for the, uh, you know, if you put it into the field to let it decompose. Um, also, that decomposition produces a lot of methane, which is, we all know, is a greenhouse gas. So, you know, the question is, why not, you know, use these to produce energy? Um, there's a couple different types of ways to utilize uh, energy stored in biomass. Um, so here's, uh, we'll give you a little, little background. Um, so the region project, which is rice hall energy generation, is focusing in uh, gasification. Um, I'll just you know, briefly go over this. It's a, a type of uh, lack of oxygen environment, which provides uh, partial combustion. So it actually sequesters the carbon. Um, 
which which means uh, kind of locks in the carbon, and uh, so it's a carbon negative process, where in the environment, if it decomposes, it would it would break up and release those back into the environment. Um, and this process, you know, that locked in carbon is uh, coined biochar, and so we'll get get into uh, that a little bit later. And it produces a gas. This gas is called syn gas or producer gas, and it can be utilized in, uh, instead of natural gas. So, you know, saving a, using a fossil fuel. We also, where we learned most of the fundamentals of gasification is through research, but also we are lucky enough to go to a company in Berkeley called All Power Labs, um, and they, uh, they, you know, open source company. They had us come over, had a, had a workshop, and uh, you know, we're really lucky to be, uh, you know, in contact with these guys. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, then also, this process over here is anaerobic digestion. So it's a type of biological breakdown. You can think of it as a, a compost pile. Right? It produces methane, and it's uh, you know they capture the methane and utilize it uh, to produce electrical energy or burn it for uh, <coughs> heat needs. And uh, the co-product of this is a really nutrient dense, um, basically compost. Right? And, and by compost, you mean it's so it's not, but it's an energy source, right? Yeah. So, so you're you're microbially breaking down the material, and that process produces methane. Um, and it's like, you know, like a compost pile. You have, you know, you see the sticks and everything, you kind of stir it around, it kind of breaks down to really dark, nutrient-rich um, uh, you know, biomass, basically, but broken down. So you're just, uh, anaerobic digestion is a type of mechanized version of composting, and they control the temperature, the, uh, you know, the uh, microbial life in there to break it down to produce high-grade you know, methane. So, uh, so, you know, the idea of our project is, you know, we started with uh, a, lot of, a lot of rice hulls uh, and also this uh, batch-style gasifier here. So, you know, we want to utilize a waste product. We're in an area with a lot of agricultural um, byproducts. So, you know, utilize that. Uh, it's environmentally friendly due to the carbon negative aspect of the gasification. And uh, also, it's a production of the soil amendment, which is biochar, uh, which is really cool. And then the uh, cook stove gasifier is uh, it's Paul Olivier's cook stove gasifier that we're using currently, uh, which is a batch-style gasifier, which uh, they use in Vietnam to cook food on. It was a um, design to, instead of cooking food on a wood fire in their house and breathing in a lot of smoke, it was developed to help mitigate that issue. So our goal is to our goal is to take this concept and then adapt it to industry here. You know, we can't have a batch style process; it needs to be automated. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of go into that. Okay. So presentation overview. Now that we have you know kind of the background of our of our project, what is biomass to energy? Uh, so we'll go into like, what is biomass, then we'll get into the details of the region project, and then our role. You know, how do we fit into making this happen and utilizing te these technologies? Um, and then, like I said before, you know, the next step is automating a gas fire, so it'll work with uh, our industry here, along with the applications and uses of biochar. So here's a picture of our team hard at work. This is awesome. Like, this, you know, talking to some of the seniors here, the senior projects can either go really good or it can be a challenge. But I'm blessed to have an awesome group here, and uh, so you know, here we are hard at work. Uh, we're monitoring the reactor temperatures just to kind of lock down all the parameters of gasification so that we can, uh, you know, just know as much as we can about it. 
So, you know, what is biomass energy, or what is biomass in particular? You know, uh, so biomass is basically any type of plant-based material in those very simple terms. But you can think of a plant as, as a solar panel, right? Because so as plants grow, they absorb sun energy and you know photosynthesis and a lot of you know basic. You know, those are simple version of it. But so this plant grows and it gets to a point where we decide we want to eat part of it. You know, and in rice we eat the, the grain of rice and there's lots of you know pro, uh, plant material along the way. But in a broccoli plant we eat this, our body digests it, we get the energy. In my case, I ride my bicycle around, you know, do some math equations, uh, <laughs> stuff like that. But the leaves and the stalk actually contain a lot of energy as well. So we can capture that energy through, uh, you know, thermal conversion, which is gasification, or um, biological conversion, which is anaerobic digestion. Okay, so basically, it's like, you know, it's like a solar panel. So that's pretty cool. So, the next question is, so we have all these rice hulls, we have a means of converting it into uh, heat energy or potentially electrical energy. So the question arises is, you know, knowing how much energy it takes to dry a ton of rice, which is seven therms of, of heat energy, with some electrical energy as well, but, so, you know, how much energy is in the rice hulls? So, we very craftily designed an experiment uh, using this, this gas fire here, there's a picture of it here, which uh, I don't want to get into too much details, but we, uh, we wrote up a procedure, kind of sent it to the chemistry department at Butte College. They signed off on our methodology, and we did this experiment for $40. We went to a junkyard, bottle of materials, we had a little makeshift heat exchanger, um, which, you know, we had issues with the percent, what was the percent um, efficiency of our heat exchanger, which we ran uh, natural gas with a known BTU value and found that coefficient to find our percentage of uh, the heat exchanger. So we were able to get a very precise number in the, you know, with, with, uh, with this contraption here. So in that process, you know, 49 pounds of rice hulls who produce one therm of energy. Um, so that a therm of energy is 100,000 BTUs, and that's how you buy your uh, gas from PG&E. So just to kind of give you a, uh, something to base that on, while also capturing a quarter of the weight in biochar. So what that is, is you know, we initially start out with the rice hulls here, uh, we gasify them, and this is actually a quarter of the weight. So you know, the volume-wise, it's it's uh, not quite that, but. And then, uh, so what's, you know, what's really cool about this project is uh, that it's carbon negative. And that's, you know, we're here to think about, you know, CO2 in the atmosphere, how that affects climate, and also, uh, so AB32, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but it's a regulation to reduce uh, CO2 uh, gas in the environment back to 1990s level. Okay? So that uh, regulation has manifested a, the first carbon tax. It's in California, in, a, in place right now, uh, fairly recent. But what that does is um, after a certain amount of CO2 being released into the atmosphere, you're charged at a rate of $10 a ton for CO2. Um, so, you know, the intent of this uh, carbon trading is that companies that produce over a certain amount of CO2 will then the money will be funneled into companies that are producing credits. Um, there, there is some research um, out there. Um, Theodore um, Landshield that also proposes that there's a lot of you know solar and uh, so from the sun and the earth magnetic connections and the sun. So I think that, you know, we're in a universe and there's a lot of things going on. So to base it just off of CO2, you know, I think there's, there's a lot to be said about that. So, you know, do your research and check it out. 
Um, but CO2 definitely needs to be monitored. So, with that said, I'm to <coughs> Robert and he'll continue on. I had a question about the, the experiment. Could you go back oh, to yes. the slides? Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Um, so, one therm of energy you were saying, the conversion to BTUs, what is that in application to like our gas bill? Like, how much is one therm? Well, so uh, one therm is 100,000 BTUs, which is British thermal unit. Yeah. Um, you're talking about how much you pay, like, cost-wise? Well, like, um, 100,000 BTUs, how long does it take for us to use that in, in our house or something? Like, on average, an average California resident or something? Um, you know? I'm not sure how much, like, if you, if you look on your bill, it'll say so many therms of energy, okay. of natural gas or um, something. So you can kind of get a, a you know, let me jump in there. Yeah. 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 Uh, forced air furnace in your house is rated at 100,000 BTU. Uh, that means that in an hour it uses up one third okay. of energy when it runs, and it runs about a dollar or two dollars, depending on who, what the gas rate is, uh, to uh, buy one third of energy from okay. the gas company. Okay. So, so 50 pounds of rice hulls is equal to about an hour of me using my stove. Is what you're saying? Right. Okay. And um, the 12 pounds of carbon that you have in the form of charcoal there? Yeah, basically. Um, is that what came out of that that uh, oven or um, gas, gas fire? Gas fire? Is this the amount that comes out of that? Uh, off of that 49 pounds? Is that? No, no. This is. Um, so I don't. I, I forgot the exact weight of this, but this much of rice hulls produces this much of okay. biochar, which is a quarter of the original weight. But it's, okay. you know, it's just way lighter and it still kind of holds its structure. Okay. You know, and so, so you're considering that like, that's pure carbon it's dioxide that's not being released into the atmosphere? That's what you're Carbon. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll cover that. Okay. Um, <coughs> 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 All right. Cool. So um, our, our role in this is actually to educate you guys, to let you guys know, you know what possibilities are out there. Um, we want this to succeed, that's why we're, we're trying to educate you on this. Um, basically, um, we want to propose, um, or actually, <laughs> isolate a problem. So we've, we've kind of got the problem down, we've got too much CO2 going into the atmosphere. Um, we're trying to reduce that number um, by doing this process of gasification. Um, and we want to pose the solution, which is using the gasification unit in large scale. So we want to actually be able to put it to our farms, our rice uh, farms specifically. Um, so that's where we are identifying the processes that would benefit. We can also use this process in other areas, so like the um, walnut orchards. We can actually use walnut poles to actually guess by. We're strictly going for the rice holes right now. Um, and we want to be that driving force like we've said, we've, we've put time into this. We all enjoy this. This has actually been fun for all of us. We've learned, we've educated ourselves about a lot of this material. Um, so the design that we have is actually by Alexis T. Bologna. Um, he's, he's actually designed a continuous flow rice full gasifier. Now this uh, is actually scalable. It can start out from the 40 centimeter in diameter all the way up to 120 centimeters in diameter. So it is getting larger scale. Um, and we basically want to be able to automate it. Um, that's where I come in. Uh, since I'm going for electrical engineering, I really want to be able to play with automation and to be able to create energy. And we'll get in more into that in a second. But basically the things that it needs is a feed and discharge. So be, we want to be able to feed it continually and then be able to take out the biochar. So you've seen the two different types of materials. We've got the rice holes and then the biochar coming out at the bottom. And so we want to be able to do that. And the brain behind it, we want to use the Arduino. Arduino is actually a pretty uh, getting bigger um, programming, uh, programming, um, it's, a, a link, uh, it's a program, sorry, and it's also a, a chip. Uh, a set of circuit. And uh, 
it basically uses C++. That's the type of programming language. And it's actually kind of the in-between. Um, it's not assembly language. It's not that far down, so most people actually can understand it. And it's not too easy that uh, just anyone can change your code. So it, it's kind of good in that way. Um, it's also modular. So this type of thing, as you can see in the second picture on the right, um, it actually can have shields. They're, they're small little adaptions. So you can buy separate shields, put it on. So those two on the top, those are actually both motor shields. So you can actually play with motors using this Arduino. So the Arduino is basically the brain, and then you can add little limbs to it, kind of, if you think of it that way. And then the community for this type of, of um, the, the Arduino is just huge. It's getting bigger. More people are getting into it. Um, the company All Powered Labs is actually using the Atmega uh, 250, uh, a big Atmega. Um, it's actually a very big processor made by the, the same um, people. It's, it's actually awesome of them. Uh, the electrical engineer there was talking with me, and he's really the one that got me very interested in being able to convert the energy. So that's, that's basically what they do. They convert energy. They do it a different way. But uh, what we want to do, and it's on the drawing board basically, is to do thermal couples. Um, thermal couples are a pretty simple thing. It's basically just to be able to measure temperatures, but we want to be able to hook it up to the Arduino. Uh, so basically we'd be able to take in the information of the temperatures, because we want to be able to regulate things based off of temperatures. The hotter it gets, we want to tend to cool it down maybe, so add a little fan in. So with those motor shields, we can actually cool it down. Um, so the electrical energy that we want to be able to create um, is usually based off of um, steam. So a lot of the things that we use today um, are created by steam power. Uh, so when we burn coal, we tend to use steam to actually create <coughs> our electrical energy. Water is a lot of the, the hydroelectric. We use water there too, just a different form. So um, we want to do it by doing a steam uh, process. Heating the water with the gas, gas from the gasification. So we'll burn the gas and then steam, uh, heat up the water to steam. Um, we basically just need the motor in order to convert it to the electrical energy. You can see it on the right in the picture with the light bulb. Um, so other than that, we also want to do moisture sensors. So with our biochar, um, to be able to uh, figure out how much moisture is in the soil, uh, that would be a very good thing to be able to know, basically, so that we, we can figure out how the water retention is. So, I have a question on that last one. Yeah. The dry steam power plant. Uh, this is a specific type. So this isn't the specific one that we're going for. <coughs> we just want to... Dry steam? Yeah. It's actually... So this is actually from a geyser. Uh, this, that's what they do with oh, dry okay. steam. That's how they, they explain it. They um, use a geyser and it actually goes up. They don't have to do anything, really. It's the Earth's doing the... the but, but it is a technical terminology for a certain type of uh, steam that is high enough temperature and yeah. supercharged steam that it doesn't have any moisture in it. It's a, it sounds like an oxymoron, but uh, uh, yeah. uh, thermodynamically, it's called a dry steam. And superheated above, yeah. significantly above. So, um, it's the proof of concept. So we're, we're, that's why we're using these to make sure that we can actually put this to a larger facility. That's where we want to be able to adapt it. And that's why we're doing all this research. We're trying to get the information so that it is able to be put into a big, large-scale production. And then next we're going to talk about... Okay, so after we gasify rice hull um, and harvest the energy from it, what we actually have left is biochar. Um, so I'll be talking about biochar. I'm, the, I'm part of the biochar side of our team, and um, our part is to study the effects of what happens when we put this um, gasified rice hull back into the soil. Um, there's been a lot of studies being done on it, 
and that's really what's encouraging us to pull forward and keep on doing the same research that's being done to see if it could be a good uh, soil amendment. So this semester we're conducting our research um, using the scientific method that we've learned in our classes and also um, we hope, we really want to support Regen's mission of looking at this full circle process by researching what we can do with the byproduct. So what biochar is, is basically just charcoal made by people, but we make it at a higher temperature to drive out more of the junk inside, which is why we get this lightweight material compared to the original product. And the idea of biochar is, like Willis was saying, using the process of paralysis to convert biomass, which is just basically anything you can imagine decomposing. So if it can decay, you can turn it into biochar. Um, anyway, we're using the biomass in the form of rice holes, and we're adding it to the soil as an amendment to form a carbon sink, which is just basically a carbon storage area. There have been a lot of reported benefits of using biochar in soils, and so for our project, we're just looking to see it for our own eyes and reaffirm tests that have already been done, basically. Um, The carbon structure of biochar is this here under a microscope. You get this sponge-like texture, and it's durable, and it's almost pure carbon in the form of graphite. So once you put it in the soil, it'll stay there for exceptionally long time. So I mean, it's been reported for hundreds to thousands of years. So because it's got this sponge-like texture, like a sponge, it's able to trap and exchange nutrients for the plants. And so it gives you benefits of increased nutrient retention, increased water retention, and the increased surface area gives you all this space for your microbial populations in the soil to attach to. So they, in return, will use your soil to create more nutrients for you. So it's really a cool process. Okay, so this is one of the examples that I pulled up just to kind of give you an idea of what we're trying to research here. So biochar has the potential to do great things in soil. We just need to test it with different crops, redo these tests, test in our area, test it with different soils. And this is one of the tests that are going on in Hawaii, done by one of the colleges there. And as you can see, the one with this is corn amended with biochar in the dirt. And this is the result as compared to without biochar. So in terms of the region project, the benefit of biochar is completing that full circle concept that we talked about. So we're taking this idea of taking something from the ground and processing it and when we wouldn't be using it otherwise into a form that we can return to the soil to make more food. So it's kind of a continuation of the energy like Phyllis was talking about to get his math done. Um, and in doing this, we add that biochar back to the soil and it creates a carbon sink, that carbon storage area. And traditionally what you do is you, the farmers will go out and plow these rice holes back into the field and flood it. And over time, as it decomposes, it releases all these greenhouse gases that contribute to all of our carbon problems that you're all aware of, I'm sure. And uh, so you, it may seem weird to, to think that uh, burn, you know, half burning rice holes is better than allowing them to naturally decompose in terms of our greenhouse gases. But throughout the life cycle of plants, what they basically do is they absorb all the CO2 in from the air and they use that to create every part of themselves. And then once they die, all of that has to go somewhere, and that's the atmosphere. And so what we do is we put it in this graphite form that's really stable and strong, and once it's in the soil, it's not going anywhere. And so that means it's in the ground and not in the air for generations. And that's a big contributor of what you're seeing, along with improving your soil health at the same time. It's pretty exciting. Uh, so one of the exciting things about biochar is its longevity and durability. This, the terra preta soils of the Amazon are pretty much a key example of really why there's so much information emerging and so much research being done in biochar. Um, what we have here is a picture of the Amazon soil. So it was noticed that one part of the Amazon was growing a lot more, a lot better than the other part of the Amazon. They wanted to figure out why. And after the soils were analyzed, this is what they found. They realized that there, in the fertile side of the soil, there is 
three meters thick of biochar. They believe that this is um, remnants of indigenous civilizations in the way that they were conducting their own agricultural practices, but then they also carbon dated this um, biochar, and it's up to 7,000 years old, and it holds 18 times more carbon than the regular soil. Mm -hmm. So fertile, holds carbon, lasts longer, we're into it. <laughs> all right, so we got so interested in biochar with all of our research that we decided we wanted to start doing some tests for ourselves. So we coordinated with faculty at our school, specifically Mike Williams was a huge help in developing these projects, and Katya had great input also, and <laughs> thank you. So what we did for this one is we basically just wanted to see which seeds germinate better, those that have biochar or those that don't. So what we did is we took 22 petri dishes, half of them we put soil in, the other half got a 50-50 biochar soil mixture. And then on top of the soil we put a filter paper down, we put 10 milliliters of water in each container, added 20 seeds, and then put a lid on and left them for two days. So the only variable we intended for the experiment was just how many seeds there are. So here's a little graph of our data. As you can see, the plants that germinated in the biochar soil did significantly better. And what that relates to is you look at how many farmers are going and direct tilling seeds into their fields. If you can have more, you know, better seed germination, you're having better crop yields. And it's also a huge indicator of soil toxins. If the tox soil's toxic, seeds aren't going to germinate. So it's an indicator of healthy soil. So that was a really exciting experiment. So to continue that, since we got such exciting results, we wanted to see what it was like to grow biochar in plants for a longer span of time. So in this one, we decided to test radishes because they grow fast and they're really showy. And uh, so basically we just did four mixtures of soil. We did pure potting soil, the outdoor, our outdoor potting mix provided from the Butte College Horticulture Department. Um, we did one that was the 10% biochar, 30% biochar, and 50 and each one we gave them the same conditions. They're all randomly placed on trays so that one of them didn't get better sunlight than another or anything like that. And so when it came time, you know, weeks passed, we go and check them out and first, you know, they're out of order. We measured the cotyledons to see, and that's just the baby leaves on the plant, <coughs> the first ones that spring up, and we just wanted to see how, how wide they grew. So we just took a ruler, measured them, and got a little idea of how, how big they were getting right away. And then after that, we went in and we harvested all of them and we cut off the greens, washed them all, and then we dried them in, in a, the college ovens there in the biology department. And we then took them to the balances and we compared the weights from soil mixture to soil mixture to see how they measured up compared to each other. So here's some of our results. As you can see from both the cotyledon test and the full plant growth test, the 30% biochar did significantly better than any of the other combinations. And the 50% was almost standing right with the pure soil, which is pretty cool to think that we're taking this waste product and making half the soil that waste product and it's performing at the same, you know, the same quality as the typical soil. So that was really exciting. And for some reason, our 10% biochar didn't do as well. So we're going to continue some experiments and see if these results are consistent. And these are all just preliminary tests. We're going to do a lot more in the future. Okay, so another test that we ended up doing is a really common bioassay called the worm avoidance test. They usually um, use the worm avoid avoidance test to see if, well, what we are using it for is we wanted to see if worms would inhabit a biochar soil. Um, that's really important because we want worms to be part of our soil ecology. So um, this was a useful test in figuring out if the things that we want growing with our plants will grow in the medium that we're going to grow our plants. Um, <coughs> and also, um, to see if there's any toxins, like we assume that if our worms don't want to go into our biochar, that there's something toxic about it. Uh, and so the results of this ended up being, or wait, sorry. Okay, so the setup of the experiment. What we have here is kind of the experiment that we did. We did it twice, we only did it with one mixture which was 50% biochar. But what we have here are these round containers. We put a midline or we put a divider in the middle of the containers. 
On one side of the divider, we put 100% soil. On the other side of the divider, we put 50% biochar, 50% soil. We removed the midline divider. We put 20 worms on the midline, and it was up to them to figure out which side that they wanted to go to. <laughs> and the worms decided that biochar is okay. We actually got higher results, which was pretty amazing because 50% biochar is, um, now that I'm finding, it's kind of a high application. But they, there was 70% um, average in our biochar mixtures as opposed to the regular soil. Okay, so another test that was really important to do was, um, was the pH test. It's really important to know the pH of your soil and it's important to know the pH of what you're putting into your soil. This is based on different crops. Every crop's a little different. And so this is an important test for us to do to see how biochar might affect the pH of something. So how we did this is we did 15 milliliters of biochar, 100 milliliters of distilled water. Distilled water has the neutral pH. We mixed them together, seeing how the pH would change with the addition of biochar, and we tested the pH of the solution. Um, the biochar solution, the biochar water solution, changed in pH, and of all of our trials, it came out basic. This is, um, this is actually, I've read this, you know, in a lot of different places. They are using biochar in acidic soils all around the world for properties pertaining to its basic properties. Is basic pH. Um, and then future testing. We are not done yet. We plan on doing more and more testing. Uh, we, one of the tests that we want to do is growing rice and biochar. This is a huge, important thing to do for our team. You know, we're researching this full circle rice whole industry, and it's important for us to figure out if a rice whole biochar industry can sustain itself what would be the point if it could not. So um, our ultimate goal is to grow biochar, uh, rice in biochar. Right now, that's not exactly what we have at our, at our fingertips. So in the meantime, we're going to be doing other tests that I think are equally as important in finding the different qualities of biochar. One of those tests is the water retention test. We want to know how much water biochar can hold and for how long. We want to compare that to the soils that we already use. Um, another one that we want to do is the nutrient retention test. We want to see exactly what compounds are kept in our biochar and for how long they're kept in there. And we want to know the amounts of them. Uh, and then another thing, we want to repeat our experiments. We'll be repeating these experiments over and over. We'll be making them bigger. We'll be making them better. <laughs> we'll, um, we're doing this so that we can get more and more data so that we can look for inconsistencies, consistencies in our data. And most of all, um, through continued experiment repetition, we're we're also improving our techniques. So, what do rice hulls have to do with solar energy? And I think we're going to kind of flip it back to Nena to kind of talk about that and uh, what what region has attracted in terms of attention. Okay, are you going to do the personal story after me? Uh huh. Oh, perfect. Well, I'm not going to do. You, you. We'll well, thank you. They're going to. So just very quickly, uh, thank you for putting that slide up there. One of the things that's really exciting when you start working on a project, and this project has been going now for a year. Is that my right? A year and a couple of months. A year and a couple of months. And really, we've just been doing it with whatever little bits of pieces of money we could find, and they're doing it just out of the goodness of their heart. No one's getting paid for it. And fortunately, in this fall semester, we were submitted a proposal to Constellation Energy, which is a national organization that funds projects that are focused on energy production and education on energy production and alternative energy ideas. And so our um, grant proposal proposed this question, what do rice hulls and solar energy have in common? And they funded the project. And the project is that we will have the group of Regen, which is looking at rice hulls producing energy, and you've just heard a lot about that. And we also have a sister project that is a, actually a solar energy alternative project where we have another group of interns, and they're looking at solar energy, and the two are going to come together. And we're going to combine those to be able to present to our community how something like rice hulls and solar are actually producing the same things right here in our own region of the world 
and around the world together. And they're not really separate. And so we were very fortunate, and you can see that they awarded us $25,000. And actually, we have a matching um, challenge that if we're able to raise another $25,000, they will give us another $25,000. And the cool thing about that is it actually does take money to do these experiments. And, but what I think is actually cooler as the MESA director and as someone that was a first generation college student trying to make my way through it, um, we're, we're going to be able to provide some stipends to the students, some money, so that they can start getting paid for being scientists already, for being engineers already. And that way, while they have jobs in other places, they'll be able to maybe reduce their hours and focus on the research that they're doing to better themselves as individuals to better their families and to better our communities at large. And maybe, as you can tell from this fine group, the world, right? Because this has impact that could change. In Becoming a professional and uh, you know, learning about you know, how to work in a team and getting outside of the classroom um, and, and uh, you know, showing you know, a future company that I'm trying to get a job for that you know, this is what I've done in my past and this is you know, the experiences that I've had. And I also want to point out that if it wasn't for the mentors kind of stepping in and giving us some opportunity to start working on, that we want it, you know, less likely to, to be here today. So I want to encourage you guys to, you know, in, like, like connect with a, a younger student or a younger person and, you know, be their mentor because this, you know, it's, that's, what, that's what life's about and that's how we got here today, so. So uh, for me, you know, I got into this project because it was an internship. <coughs> Nena kind of gave me a brief idea of what it was going to be about. It sounded interesting creating energy. And then Willis actually was already going to be joining, so I was like, oh, I know Willis. So that's, that's where I started, and I had no idea what it was going to be like. And I've gained so much knowledge from it, just kind of the, definitely communication. That's, that's one of the things that we've learned a lot about, because without good communication, um, it, it's hard to do anything. You can't really get a whole lot done except for by yourself. And in a group situation, which these guys are, are awesome with how much they can get done on their own, but as a group we've done so much more combined. And so that's where we want to educate you guys along with educating ourselves because the more knowledge we can get out of this, the better. Um, we can actually help the environment more. And, and as far as uh, getting a, a different career, because I'm not sure how long I'll be in this internship, um, it, it's, it's basically helping me be educated for that. I want to be there so I can provide for my family. And so when I got an in internship, basically Nana just came up to me and told me she had an internship opportunity for me. It involved dirt and locking down carbon, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so I, I jumped on it, and it's been so much fun working with these guys. They're, they're all just such exceptional teammates. Thank you, guys. But, uh, yeah, and so it's been the biggest thing I've learned from this project is not being afraid to ask when there's somebody who you think might be interested in helping you. And I've gotten so much out of it. I've developed these amazing relationships with professionals that I probably would have never known otherwise. And I've got to work with awesome people who are on my team and getting to have all the support around me. It's really a good kickoff for the rest of my career. Um, Region has been a really good opportunity for me. I, uh, you never think of how you're going to conduct research or like where you're going to do it, but you just know that eventually when you get out of college, that's what you're going to need to know how to do. And so they teach you all of this stuff in all of our chemistry classes and our biology classes. And Regen really just gave me an opportunity to like put my hands on onto it and start figuring out how we're going to do experiment proposals, figure out how we're going to write our procedures, really just allowed us to take the initiative on not only our own learning and our own education, but really like being able to apply that and actually step forward into your career without without um, without a degree like that's I'm completely happy with that. And uh, this is a really important, especially the biochar aspect of this project is extremely important to me. It has potential to do things around the world. And um, actually right now, one of the things that is like 
amazing about biochar is before it's even turning into an industry, it was an important. It's happening all around the world. People are selling it. They're putting it straight into their soil. There's huge projects, hundreds and hundreds of projects going on around the world on this small scale using small gas silos like this and incorporating it into little fields like the, like the corn that you are seeing. And these are, these are farmers. These are like real people doing stuff for them. And I'm just like really glad to see that I'm working with something that immediately has a use. Um, I think a couple of questions and then I want to do a wrap up. Are any of the right companies um, doing this experiment? Just know that I know of, this is like, I mean, so far, Willis might know something about that, but I, I haven't had, I haven't heard of biochar in these county in a rice field or any other field, really. We've been getting rice hulls from, from lumber farms and, uh, you know, trying to develop relationships and continuing our work, and, and that's our, you know, our, our aim. That's where we're trying to go with this. So. They are doing some testing. London Fund? Well, yeah, no, I'll, uh, I'd like oh, to you wanted to address that? Uh, sure, I'd like to jump in just like, uh, my name is Lance Benson, and I do represent the London Family Fund. Thank and, you. And uh, we do have an association with this guy, Willis, and his came and made a proposal to us last year. We are in the process right now of undertaking the preliminary steps to putting in a gas pyrolysis system mm. at our facility mm -hmm. and utilizing the, the hulls that we generate in our processes and also we're going to do some experimentation with the biochar in the field situation this summer. So yes, there is someone around here that is uh, okay. <laughs> so I'd like to reiterate, I would like to work with these guys again and kind of promote that and, and uh, advance it if I could. Yay. Have you tested the, the char? Does it have properties enough to filter and maybe bind some of the toxins in the soil? When people are looking into that. There, it's got properties for cation exchange capacity that are looking really positive. And I've actually seen studies where they, uh, it's in the, the biochar revolution that I saw the other day, but the, there was a field that is having, having some kind of problem with toxin wash off out of their crops. And so they were testing the water after they put biochar down, and they had a, mm -hmm. I feel like it was a decrease in iron, and I don't remember what else, but. Well, a lot of problems come with um, nitrogen leaching, so if they can mine some of that, you maintain it, if it's good. And, and then, of course, you still have problems with phosphates, with fertilizers, you know, so that's a really good retention as well, if they can figure out a way to. Yeah, yeah from what I read, it's really positive for that. So I'd like to make a few closing comments. And first of all, I want to thank the interns for representing themselves so well. And also, I think we're getting you excited about what is happening, um, not just in the world, but right here, our own little part of Butte County. And in saying that, I also want to thank those people that have been contributing along the way. Obviously, we took a moment and thanked Constellation Energy because we really appreciate that connection. But as we know, Lundberg Farm has also been supporting not just this project, but our other project called Rehab Rice Holes as Alternative building material and without their support and their encouragement and their actual literal rice halls we couldn't be this far along the road but beyond that they've actually accepted our students going and presenting their projects to them so that they could get practice and prepare as professionals so thank you very much to the Lindbergh Family Farms. is also our mentors that are doing the technical components of it. John Dahlgren and Steve Ferrer, this is Steve Ferrer's brainchild. You know, he has the rice hole for his alternative building materials. That's our other project. And thanks to him, he began this project as well. And uh, you can tell that uh, one idea can go really far. So I want to plant a picture. So when I started working at MESA, I would hand out applications to the students and say, oh, HP is looking for someone. Remember I mentioned that? Sony's looking for someone. And in their minds, I could see the idea. Oh, Nana's not talking to me. And I could see mentally that application going in the garbage. I'm not old enough. I don't have the right grades. I don't have the right classes. I'm not far along enough. Am I really even an engineer or a scientist? So the idea was to right here in, 
um, someone gave me the idea to do projects on the Butte College campus to see what would happen. And our first project was the BWO project, which is a biofiltration project, and they're presenting this afternoon at 2 o'clock. And that project um, is taking place on our campus has been going for four years, where they've taken capturing the water off one of the parking lots and biofiltering it. And what happened then is the students started seeing other students get involved that were in their classes, and they started saying, well, if that person can do it, then I can do it. I think I'm getting a better grade. I think I know a little more of the same. So they started self-selecting in versus self-selecting out. And why does that matter? Because once someone says yes, and they start at the beginning, magic begins to happen. And you see the result of this magic. I like to refer as to be well the biofiltration project as like the original project, and then it had babies. Mm. And the first baby was the rehab, which is Rice Hall's as alternative building material. Okay. And the second one is this region project, and now we have the C project, which is the solar energy as alternatives. And also, solar energy alternatives. Thank you, Grid Alternatives is helping us. Any of you that might be familiar, they're a local agency that provides no cost. Uh, solar panels to low-income families. So see how our circle is bigger? And in saying that, if we are a social sustainable community, we will grow our own engineers and our own scientists. And that's what we're doing with this project. Here's your future engineers, here's your future scientists. Some of you are out there, your students. If someone invites you to participate, say yes. If you're a professional and you have an idea, Reach out to someone because a little way, a little thing can go a long way to all of a sudden babies taking place. But babies that change lives, that change families, and that change communities. Thank you everyone for being here.